All right. No question. Okay. No question. So then, most important thing. What's the difference between a type and a classification? Remind us. It's like covering and lining and blend. Yes. And classification is like how it is shaped and like simple and then squamous. Exactly. Exactly. Make sure you know the difference between that. Should I do the pictures? No. no. No, okay. So these are the pictures. So in the in the left here versus the right here, you see simple versus stratified. Now the interesting thing is about stratified, and here's the trick, okay? That when you when you want to name a stratified layer, you always name it from the surface layer. So if that surface layer has in it cuboidal cells, then it's going to be stratified cuboidal. If that surface layer has squamous cells, then it's going to be squamous, stratified squamous. That doesn't mean that you can't have other types of cells below that, okay? So that's the way the naming system works, because as you'll see when we get into the integumentary system, that the cell's shape changes as they migrate forward and up until eventually they become dead cells. And that's a little confusing to people. Right? So the other thing you want to notice here is these are cuboidal cells. But notice that, you know, these look cuboidal-esque. But then as you go up, you also have these cells that look like, I don't know, this looks like an upside down triangle. Right? This one is a little bit more oblong. So you then, how do you decide? How do you decide? Well, you take a look at all of them and you say overall if I had to put them in a category which one fits the best because cells this is what cells actually look like they're not perfectly cuboidal it doesn't work like they don't stack like boxes here you have the different shapes squamous is flat <coughs> again cuboidal this is ideal right this is a lot of this is idealized and then columnar all right Question, right out of the gate. I will read them to you to give you time to get your clickers out. Two major functions of epithelial tissue are A, to strengthen muscle and produce hormones. B, cover slash line and to make up part of the glands. C, to bind cells from one another make surfaces smoother to resist bacteria. D would be A and C, and E would be none of the above. So we'll start this and see what ends up happening.
good. 17, 18, 20. Oh, we almost got there. Okay, <laughs> next time. Next time we'll get to 20. Yeah, this is, this is really funny. You guys never pick A. It's, it's just really interesting. It's just an observation. It doesn't mean anything. It's just interesting. Nobody in any class, any of the three sections on any of these iClicker questions has ever picked A. That's just interesting. There's some, there's some aversion to the letter A. We may have to have a discussion about that one day. All right. So, B or D? Of the, now, I've done this with the other two groups because they, they got ahead. Um, we had a lot more discussion here. So, there was a little bit more of a spread on this one. This one is pretty good. So, that's right. I mean, that's the correct answer. So, that's, that's encouraging. I mean, 95% is pretty good. Let's talk about why A isn't right. This is where it starts to get interesting. Because you got it right, that's good, but it's not good enough. So, why isn't A right? <coughs> What's wrong about it? Yeah, CJ, and then uh, Jordan. It's A faster, so if you're small, it could like, transport across the body. So okay, it's, that's a logic. It's not 100% right. Jordan, what were you going to say? It doesn't strengthen muscle because you don't find it around skeletal muscle. Now, getting back to what CJ said, it's avascular. Does that mean that because it's avascular, it can't produce a hormone? No, it can produce hormones. Glandular epithelium actually does produce hormones. Now, I get his logic in that it's not very efficient, right? Because it has to then diffuse. It isn't very efficient, but this is the way the body's set up. It, they do. Thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, right? Those are all glands that have this glandular epithelial tissue in it. So that means that parts of them, at least where the epithelial tissue is, does not have vascularization. So it's slow. But slow isn't always bad, right? It's not always good. It may not be the most efficient, but maybe that's what your body needs. Maybe that's a... a sort of a time delay that's built into the system. But at least you're thinking about it. So that's what I want you to do. Why? So, yeah, Katie. I was wondering, is it more of a secondary function for producing hormones? Or that's a video like primarily to perform some video secondary to make hormones? Uh, it, it can be. So that's Katie's question. Is it just a secondary function, the production of the hormones? It can be. It can be. And every gland is a little bit different, but that's good. You got to think about that. It might be a secondary function. It may not need to be as efficient. Okay. Um, C. Why isn't C correct? Let me move this out of the way. We know how many you got right, so you don't need that anymore. Why isn't C correct? What do you think? What binds cells together? Okay, uh, Arjun, I saw you first, and then Teresa. Cell junctions. Okay, Teresa, tell me something about this make surfaces smoother to resist. Now, this is an unfair part of the question because we haven't gotten to this yet. But so, it could be part of the make junctions with the walls that resist the bacteria, uh, the water, but the water going through. And so that Yep. That would help do that. So, such as the example with gluten, the nitrogen would be the nitrogen allows for accumulation of bacteria. That's right. Exactly. Are mucous membranes made of gluten tissue? Yes. Oftentimes, it's epithelial tissue. That, that usually it's goblet cells that make the mucus. Yep. I mean, I guess that's. That's right. And so, yes. And so, actually, C, the second half, depending on how you look at it, could be half correct. Right? Because it, in skin, and the reason I said this is an unfair question is because when we get to the integumentary system, the very top layer of the epidermis becomes squamous cells. 
so that the skin actually flattens out and there's actually sebaceous oil that gets secreted that smooths it out and your skin, the outer portion of your skin because of that oil and the flattening and the waterproofing is actually resistant to bacteria because of those changes. So you're both right. You're both right. So you could you could have interpreted it either way, but you still would have gotten the same answer, meaning that C is incorrect, is because epithelial cells don't bind other cells together. So the point, I guess, of this exercise is then to say, when you read an answer, there may be two parts. One may be true, one may be not true, right? If one of them is not true, then the whole thing can't be true. Or if one of them is true, doesn't mean that the whole thing is right. And so you have to then pick. Most of you got it correct, but I would venture a guess to say that most of you didn't put that much thought into it. Probably a safe assumption, and that's okay. That's why I'm making you do it now. So when you read any multiple choice question, don't just jump, okay? Have an idea of this might be the answer. This is, I'm thinking that the answer is this. Okay? And then make sure, and then put like a mark next to it, and then go through it and say, okay, let me make sure, especially if you have time. You know, the, the, the travesty that I see is some of these exams, they take longer, some don't take as long. You leave with like 25 minutes left, and you make stupid mistakes along the way that if you just say, I'm going to wait five minutes, sit down, and then just check a couple of things and make sure that you wouldn't have gotten those questions wrong. So take the time. Don't rush, read through them, make sure. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So B was the correct answer. All right, simple squamous epithelium. This first, don't worry about this table stuff. It's from a different book, a different class. This is pretty much what we talked about, scale-like cells. Here's the new piece. The new piece is adapted for diffusion and filtration, okay? That's important. So now whenever you see, now whenever you see a squamous cell, okay, whenever you see a squamous cell, one of the first things you think of, especially in the histology slide, is okay, this cell must have something to do with filtration and diffusion. Potentially. It's not the only thing it can do. But that's where you should start thinking about what that cell might do because, again, it might help you figure out what that is in a pinch. Where would you find these? In the lungs and in the kidneys where you do a lot of filtration. The difference between filtration, and I asked the other groups this, I'm just going to tell you, is diffusion uses electrochemical gradient, right? It uses gradients to move stuff. Filtration uses some kind of added power some kind of energy, usually it's hydrostatic. And, and people think of filtration as like water filtration, but the filtration doesn't work unless the pressure jams the water through the filter, and it's the pressure that's the difference, right? Filtration is much faster than diffusion. And next semester it becomes kind of a big deal, not so much this semester, but there's a difference. All right. Endothelium cells, so these are special types of simple squamous. One kind is called endothelium. We'll learn about them when we get to vessels. Talk about them a little bit more next semester. It lines the heart and blood vessels. They have a lot of interesting functions. Um, endothelial cells are the cells that end up getting damaged with high blood pressure. And we're going to talk about it when we get to that as to why that's problematic. Like what do these cells actually do? that when they get damaged, it becomes problematic. Mesothelium lies in the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities, right? Here's your thoracic, chest, abdominal, pelvic cavity. They're lined with this mesothelium. Um, it covers organs. Mesothelioma, you may have heard of, is a type of lung cancer um, that is caused by asbestos, and asbestos is nasty, nasty substance that used to be used in almost all construction in the United States for fireproofing. Okay, it was fireproofing. Panels, which we don't have in these classrooms, but we have in other classrooms, used to all be made out of asbestos. And it's not problematic until it becomes powderized. So if you were to take a panel 
and you move it, and all of a sudden, like dust comes off of that panel, that would be dangerous. Okay? They don't make it's illegal to use it anymore. It's still in buildings as long as you don't disturb it. It's fine. So that's what mesothelium is. Okay. So that might help you remember the mesothelium. So both of these are types of this. Simple cuboidal, again, it's a simple layer of cube-shaped cells. These are more often adapted for secretion and absorption. Not exactly the same thing. Does that mean that these are the only two functions that cuboidal cells could possibly have? No. These are the major ones. So when you see a cube-shaped cell, you say, well, maybe the area it's in is adapted for absorption and secretion. These tend to secrete things absorb. Somebody said uh, the other day in another section, well, would that mean that these cuboidal cells can then have more channels and transporters in them? Quite possibly. Absolutely. So you start thinking at the more cellular level, <coughs> transporters, channels, kinds of gaps. Sure, because they're designed for that. All right. So simple columnar epithelium consists, again, it's, it's a rectangular form of cell. So what do these cells do? There's two major types. This gets a little tricky in the nomenclature, but once I point it out to you, it's not tricky, right? You just have to remember what I'm about to tell you. A non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium cell usually contains microvilli, right? So if you're taking a look at a cell, let's say two cells, and they wouldn't necessarily be next to one another. So what I'm doing here is artificial, right? I'll do this to even show that they wouldn't normally end up next to one another. And you take a look at a cell that looks like this, and you take a look at a cell that looks like this. Depending on the resolution, Right? This one has microvilli in it. This one has cilia. They look the same, essentially, right? This one is considered non ciliated simple columnar. Now, some non ciliated simple columnar cells don't have anything on the top. So they just look like this. That's also non ciliated simple columnar. Okay? So you have to know, if you see projections, it doesn't mean it's ciliated, right? Because that assumes that the projections are actually cilia and not microvilli. That's when it gets a little tricky, unless you know something about the tissue. If you know that you're in the small intestine, well, then it has to be non-ciliated because you don't have these ciliated cells in the small intestine. If you're in the airway, Right? Go into your lungs, you don't have cilia. I mean, you have cilia, you don't have microvilli. So then you know for certain if you know location. <coughs> so, what do they do? Again, we talked about this a lot of this is just repetitive, right? Increase surface area and R and the rate of absorption. Yeah, of course, rate of absorption for sure. Goblet cells, and goblet cells is going back to what CJ was saying and what Zach was saying, I think, about mucus. Goblet cells produce mucus, and so they're located in lots of areas where every mucus is needed. Remember, mucus is both a lubricant and an adhesive. It can function as both, right? And so you're going to find goblet cells, which are these non-ciliated, simple columnar cells everywhere, lots of different places, okay? Ciliated simple columnar contains hair like process is called cilia. So they're just cilia. They don't look like cilia, they are cilia. They provide motility and help move fluids and particles along a surface. Oftentimes you'll see a goblet cell flanked, meaning on both sides you'll have a ciliated simple columnar, a goblet cell which is non ciliated simple columnar, and then another ciliated simple columnar. And that's because the goblet cell makes the mucus, the mucus sticks to things, and when those things get stuck to the mucus, then these hair-like projections that do this can slowly but surely start to move particles out of that system, whatever that system may be. OK? 
Okay. Any any questions? Okay. All right. So this is a histology slide. If you see here, we're in the we're in the um, in the large uh, you know, the small intestine. Excuse me. It's hard to see. We're in the small intestine. Okay. And this is an actual histology slide. This is a cartoon of that same structure. Okay. This is a cartoon of that same structure. So this blue here represents all of this, which is connective tissue. Then you have a basement membrane, and the basement membrane is very, very thin. It's this white part right here, okay? Basement membrane. And then on top of that, you have a side view of simple squamous, okay? Simple squamous. Now, this is the intestine. Right? And then you have muscle underneath the connective tissue. Remember, muscle surrounds the intestine. That's how peristalsis occurs. That's how things move. So, remember we talked about ciliated versus non-ciliated? This isn't even that. This is another tissue type that's in your intestine that's designed for filtration or diffusion. Right? So it's not... You can't just think of well, all cells in the intestine are non-ciliated simple columnar, because they're not. Here's a case where there's flat nuclei, right? So that whatever part of the intestine this is in, it's probably suited for diffusion and filtration, right? Function, structure, structure, function. Yeah, CJ. Can things pass through the basal lamina? Can things pass through, meaning what? Through the cells into the basal lamina? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's so there's all kinds of channels and other things that are big. I, I told you that the basal lamina, I think I know why you're asking this, because it's it's tough, right? It's hard. It is, but that doesn't mean there aren't passageways through it. Right? So you got to think about it as there's all kinds of tunnel systems that go through. So yes, they have to be able to pass. If they couldn't, if things couldn't pass through, it'd be a great foundation, but now you can't get anything in or out of that cell. Again, not very practical. So there's all kinds of channels. There's all kinds of gaps in there. But the majority of the structure is relative to other structures in your body, strong and rigid. Bless you. So this might be, and this is a, a light microscope at 700x, it might be something you could see on an exam, right? So the cells here, this is the cell. These purple things are the cell, and the rest of it's all connective tissue, basal lamina, and muscle, right? So the cell layer is very, very thin. Not very much there at all, which is what you would expect from flat squamous cells, right? If, they, if they're involved in diffusion and filtration, you don't want them to be very thick. Okay? And so this would be epithelial tissue, but then everything else would happen to be a diffusion because all of the blood vessels are now located in the connective tissue and in the muscle. Okay. So single layer of flat cells, very thin, controls diffusion. Osmosis is a specific type of diffusion that occurs with water, so it's another form of diffusion. And then, of course, filtration. Blood vessel lining, so the endothelium has this, the lining of body cavities, the mesothelium. But you also see them in the intestines. Right? Yeah, that. For absorption, would that be dealing with um, molecules that need to use channel proteins to travel in the cell? Or, I'm a little confused between uh, the difference Yeah, that's a good question. You see, his, if, if, if a simple squamous cell is diffusion and filtration, right, and then you have these columnar cells, well, what would be the difference? Anything that's going to make it through the columnar cell is going to be tightly regulated. Tightly regulated. This particular area in the intestine probably doesn't need tight regulation. It's a lot more porous. 
Okay? It's probably found more at the end of the intestine or right at the very beginning of the small intestine. Right, not in the middle where most of the absorption is. So probably has to do a lot more with water. You probably, and, and if you look here, it's sort of, well here would be the end. It's actually in the middle. It's actually in the middle. But this particular area is suited for diffusion. Does that mean that you can't keep things out? No, you can. <coughs> you can, but if you have to have a faster way for certain molecules to move that aren't dangerous to you, like water, Here's where you'd want it to be absorbed. But it, it doesn't mean it can't exclude things, right? Does that make sense? It still can exclude larger molecules. How can it do that? Yeah, Teresa. Uh, another question. Would you find this in the large intestine and the colon group? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The colon is where you find you get the final reabsorption of water, or the absorption of water in this case, not reabsorption. And that's where like cholera toxin affects, it causes people in um, like places like Africa and Central America and parts of Asia that have diarrhea that could kill you, right? Because of the water that's not being absorbed. So you find this a lot more in that. Because by that point, you're not really absorbing much. It's mostly water and the bacteria that are in there are making some types of vitamins. Right? Whereas in the small intestine, you actually mostly, that's where you're getting your absorption, and that's where you want to keep certain things out, right? Because if it gets across, if something gets, if a protein gets across here, whether it gets across a flat squamous cell or it gets across in between two simple columnar cells, you're going to get an allergy. You're going to have an immune reaction to it, right? So there still have to be ways to keep stuff out, but water you don't need to. Right? And the intestine, in general, can absorb a lot of water. And so certain areas can absorb water with sugar, salt, protein. And certain areas pretty much predominantly will only absorb water. Okay, certain sections of it. Yeah, it's really specialized. It's, it's a really interesting set of organs. We don't spend a lot of time on the yeah. Good question. Nuclei are centrally located. So you can't see them here, but the nuclei are centrally located. Um, this is one, um, but the cell is actually this big. So they're here, here, here. And the cells are in direct contact with one another. So they're still touching one another, even though they're suited for diffusion. They're very, very thin. You can keep things out with charge, right? So if you charge a particle, and you make it negative, and then you know that everything that's coming in is positively charged, well, you'll, you'll, you'll reflect that, right? Because, um, I mean, excuse me, if you, if you want to exclude things that are positive, you'd have a positive charge on, on this layer, and then they would not come in. All right. Another area, now, again, simple squamous. These are just examples of areas, right? So this is the peritoneum. The peritoneum is a double layered, a double layered part of the abdominal pelvic cavity, all right? And again, squamous cells. Can you tell just by looking at these cells where these squamous cells are located? No, you can't. But you know, okay, it probably has to do with diffusion and filtration, where might those areas be? So surface view, lining of the peritoneal cavity, <coughs> section of intestinal showing the serosa, and that's what the serosa is, serosal membranes, okay, are double layered membranes that surround things like the, the peritoneum. If you've ever heard of something called peritonitis, okay, anybody here ever have their appendix out? A lot of people. Did you get peritonitis? Well, I don't think so. Yeah, you don't think so. I did. It almost killed me my first year here. So it it got so bad that it got the inflammation from my appendix bursting. It was burst for over a week. Didn't know it. it kept going downhill. It's kind of an interesting time in my life because at every lecture I would go lower and lower and sitting. But it had gotten into this cavity here and it spread. 
it spread throughout, and it was called it's called peritonitis. So when when they did the CAT scan, when they get the CAT scan, it's CAT scan in the emergency room, they're like, you're going to surgery at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. You're not leaving here. You have peritonitis. It's everywhere. So that's what peritonitis is. This entire structure here was inflamed and infected. It's called peritonitis. Now, it doesn't mean it will kill you. I just happen to have a burst appendix on top of that that has caused it. So um, you can get peritonitis without having a burst appendix. That's why I asked about the appendix thing, because it can, it can start this process, OK? So peritonitis. All right, simple cuboidal. Again, these are not that far removed from a slide you might see in on your exam, right? Just take a look at your packet that you have in lab. So here's the pancreas. Again, this is in the uh, duodenum, which is the very first part of the small intestine that comes out of your stomach. It's called the duodenum or duodenum, however you want to pronounce it. Okay. So when you look at that, here's the layer. Here's the two. All right, the lumen or the duct of the small intestine. And these round things are nuclei. And you can't see it until you get really close. But these are cuboidal cells that are all the way around the duct. And that completely makes sense because the duodenum or duodenum, right as it comes out, right? So the, here's the stomach. The food comes out. Here's the <coughs> pancreas. What happens here is you dump a lot of enzymes, proteases, which break down proteins, lipases break down fats, amylases break down sugars, right? Because a lot of that digestion, that stuff is coming from either the pancreas and the liver is also attached with the gallbladder. So there's lots of stuff being secreted here. So you can imagine, you can imagine that these cells would be also secreting digestive enzymes, right? So these, these are not for diffusion, but they're making something. So single layer of cells, nuclei are round and centrally located. It becomes important, most of these, the nuclei are round and centrally located. When we get the skeletal muscle, they're not necessarily centrally located anymore. So that, that'll be an exception. So you can see these in the kidney. You can obviously see these in the small intestine. An example of where that may show up, that might be important to know. Again, adapted for absorption and secretion. And here you have the cartoon of that same setup, right? To sort of reorient you to where, what this might look like. And notice another thing that's weird here. If you look at the top, see, see how some of these nuclei are sort of pushed out of the way here, and there's this fuzzy, this here. Okay, so doesn't this almost look like there are two nuclei here? And if you only focused on those, that one cell, what might you think this type of tissue is? You didn't look at this big picture at all. You said you just looked at this right here. What would be a logical conclusion you could make of the type of cells? The layer. Stratified cuboidal. But it's not. Something got pushed out of the way here. I can't tell you why or what, but this is this is not. This cell and this cell were probably next to each other and just got scrunched up when they were slicing this tissue, probably. So it's not stratified cuboidal, it's simple cuboidal. Okay, so look at the whole picture. Don't look at the exception. Here's another example of simple cuboidal. Here you have a bunch of cells. Okay, this one's even trickier. Okay, this one's even trickier. So you have the lumen, right, which is the center, the duct, the middle of the tube. And then you have these cells here that are on either side. Now, they're round S, right? They're definitely not squamous. They're definitely not columnar. Everybody with me on that? Like, they don't look columnar at all. They're, they, they have some weird shape to them. They have a centrally located nucleus, but then here's where it gets tricky. Again, going back, if you focus on this here, these, let's say you don't look at the whole slide. You're in a rush on this exam. 
right? Because you've got time. You're a minute per, per slide, right? And you're not thinking this one through. You haven't put enough time into it. And you focus on one part, right? Again, and Miller says, what type of cell is this? Name this cell type. What would, what, what would be the mistake that somebody makes? They're stratified cuboidal. Is it? Well, no, because I'm telling you it's not. But why? How do you know it's not? What else would you have to see in here to sort of make that decision based on the information you know? You, I mean, you have a lot of information on the slides. You use that information, assuming you know it. How would you know it's not stratified cuboidal? Yeah. Living purple thing, the basal membrane. Here. Yeah, that's a membrane, and that's got collagen in it. So right away that says connective tissue between the cell. When you have stratified tissue, there's no connective tissue layer between them. Okay, that would be the best one. But there's other pieces of evidence. What else could you use to figure out that this isn't stratified? Yep. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a tube here between these. If this was all stratified, right, wouldn't these be one on top of the other two? And wouldn't these be on top of the other? The fact that there's a gap in there, that, that says, well, I, I don't know if this is stratified. So connective tissue layer in between them, that wouldn't happen. And then this is an even bigger gap. Even if you didn't know what that gap was, you're like, eh, this isn't stratified. This is simple. I'm not exactly sure where it is. But this probably is a tube, and this is a tube, and in fact it is. So this is from the kidneys, and the kidneys are made up of lots of tubes. So you could start guessing then, okay, simple cuboidal secretion, where might that occur where you have small tubes? And you could start, you know, again, using all of the information you have learned this semester, not just some of the information, to sort of start thinking through that. All right, non ciliated <coughs> not, okay, this is where it gets a little tricky. So I hate these diagrams, I'm gonna tell you right out, don't use these diagrams, because this diagram looks just like the next one, and they're different. They're supposed to represent something different. I don't like them, so use them if you want, but be really careful. Again, we're looking at the small intestine here, okay? This is non-ciliated simple columnar. Okay, so what would you have to do? Well, if you're looking at these cells, what's the first thing you have to determine? What would you look at first? Are you, what, what do you think you'd look at here to try to determine what this is? Microvilli. So there's something up here, but you don't know that it's microvilli, right? So you're saying to yourself, well, I only have two choices. It's either microvilli or cilia. It's one of those two for sure. That helps a little. Okay, then the other thing, what about these nuclei? If you had to draw a straight line, are they relatively even? Overall, broad picture, yes. If you start looking at the small deviations here, now you're starting to think, you're not thinking non-ciliated, simple columnar, you're actually thinking about another cell type because these sort of look like what? What's that other cell type that we talked about? Pseudostratified. It's not. Right? It's not pseudostratified because in pseudostratified one characteristic you would have to have is what? What about the apical membrane is different than here? And this doesn't occur here. You can't see it because you're not close enough. Yeah, not all of the cells would reach the apical surface, and here they all do. So this can be tricky, right? But if you look at the overall, you say, I'm going to draw a straight line from this one to this one. Yeah, it's a little bit crooked, but overall, are these pretty much in a straight line? <coughs> pretty much, right? In pseudostratified columnar, right, pseudostratified, you're going to see more hodgepodge. You're going to see like one here. 
one down here, and then you're going to see some cells that don't reach the top. So you've got to look for those characteristics. It's hard for you to see. So if you're panicking right now and saying, I don't know what he's talking about because I can't see this, it's because you're far away from it. Okay? But if you got closer if you, and you had enough time, you'd be able to pick this out. So, again, you're back to ciliated or non-ciliated. Um, if you had more, you know that these white things here, whenever you see this white gap like this, with the particles in it, that usually means it's some kind of a lipid molecule. Which means, in this case, it's, it's a goblet cell. <coughs> so it's mucus. All right, so that's where the mucus would come. Um, you can have this identical structure if this was in the lining of the airways look almost identical, but there it would be ciliated. Here it's non-ciliated, so that's not going to help you. Okay? So this one would be a tough one. This one would be a tough one. Alright? But I just wanted to show you what it was like. So this one, you could at least get it down to a 50-50 guess at that point. Unless you knew more information about it. So a single layer rectangular cells, unicellular glands, because they're called goblet cells. We're going to talk about unicellular. We already talked about this lubricate, GI, respiratory, reproductive, urinary systems, microvilli, non motile finger-like membrane division, right? So this is just a lot of repetitiveness. That's, I built it into the structure of the lectures, the repetitiveness, so you can see it over and over again. Because I think you need that. Yeah, that. But this was a question on the exam. Uh, yeah. To determine whether it was ciliated or non ciliated, would we have information like would we have the exam? If if it was a question on my exam, on the lecture portion, yes, you would, but I won't ask you this in lecture. In the in the in the lab, this is where rope memorization comes in. So your your big your big cannon, right? Your big secret weapon going into that is to just memorize as many of the pictures as you can. What I'm telling you here, so that's your big guns, right? You've seen this thing a hundred times, you know which one it is because you memorized it. What I'm telling you, the information <coughs> I'm telling you to, to work your way through this is what if you panic? What if you forget? Now you don't have any gifts. Right? So now you can fall back on what I'm showing you how to do, which is sort of, you got a minute anyway, you might as well work your way through it and say, okay, these look like they're in a line, it's either ciliated or non-ciliated, it doesn't look like anybody thinks gets to the apical membrane, okay, it's some kind of columnar, it's either ciliated or non-ciliated. You make a 50-50 guess, that's better than a zero, right? So on a two-point question, you either get a zero or a two, but if you take a 50-50 guess, you may have a chance versus leaving it blank and saying, I don't remember that one. I've seen it a hundred times. I can't tell you what it is. Right? So that's what I'm doing for you here. The best bet is to learn as much as you can. Getting back to that, you know, Martina moment the other day, give yourself as much time as your friend. The more time you have, the more time you look at these structures, the better you're going to do. Time, time, time. But if it doesn't, and, and if something goes wrong, then you can think back, okay, now how do I do it? Now at least you have a plan B. And that's what I'm giving you. This is the plan B. But if I were to do it on a lecture, which I never have, so I won't, and I would let you know for certain if I'm going to do that because I don't want to trick you, then I would give you some information and say, okay, here's some characteristics here. Here's where this might be found. And I might say, this is for certain located in the small intestine. Then you can say, okay, well, it's got to be non <coughs> That's all you really need. That's the only thing you need. But that, that would be a good thing. Okay. And again, this is just, you know, just a rehash. <coughs> okay. non ciliated simple columnar again. Now, this one, this one's weird too, okay? So, these are the cells. They're right here. If you get close, you can actually see the boundaries. These are the nuclei. Okay? This is this is fat. This is mucus. These are microvilli. In this case, on the slide, this looks like a solid layer. Okay? 
Again, hard to tell. Ciliated and non-ciliated would be tough to say. You'd have to sort of work things through. But again, you might not, that might not be enough. You could get you in the ballpark, but unless you've seen it a hundred times, you just could guess at best. Okay. So the uterine tubes, right? The fallopian tubes. Also, this is where ciliated, so this is ciliated now. Okay? So just to orient you, right, use the, use the vaginal canal, use, the, use one of the ovaries, use the other ovary, use the uterine tube number one, uterine tube number two. Okay, so that's where we're at. So now if you take a look at this, and this is why this diagram stinks, because this diagram looks just like this diagram. You don't care. Okay. Here, it's a little bit easier to see. In this case, you can actually tell that it's cilia. If you take a look at it, see how these are wispy hair-like? That's for certain. When you see that wispy hair-likeness, that's cilia for sure, because microvilli never look like that. Microvilli are very um, much more regular, and because they're regular, you usually get this solid look to them. Because they're up, down, straight. Yep. Wait, so microvilli are the extension of the plasma membrane wall, so they are, are they like separate structures? Uh, that is correct. <coughs> microvilli are an extension, whereas cilia are actually like an extension. Uh, excuse me, a separate structure that's attached to the top. Right? Yep. But you can't see that here. But what you can see is that this is, looks more solid, right? Whenever you see something that's very solid looking, and you're like, well, this is either cilia or microvilli, the more regular it is, the less gaps you see, the more you should start thinking, I think it's microvilli, because they're sort of set up really straight and narrow. When you get to cilia, because they move a lot, they're sort of wispy like here. If you see something like this, then it's for certain cilia. Because microvilli will never look like this. They're very regular, they don't really bend, right? They're, you're trying to pack as many microvilli in as you can because you're trying to increase the surface area maximally. Here, you're not really trying to increase the surface area as much as you're trying to move things. So this could be easily be in the respiratory tract, it happens to be in the female reproductive tract, doesn't matter. The function is exactly the same, okay? And here you have these cells, and again, relatively straight here. They all reach the apical surface. These are wispy hair-like structures. So when an egg is released, this completely <coughs> makes sense, right? If the entire tube is lined like this, it bounces along, and it never gets damaged. It just bounces along nice and easy, and the hair-like projections are just doing this. Sort of move down, and, and that's exactly what happens. Is there also mucus being produced here? Yeah, um, I don't actually see see a, a goblet cell, but they're in there too. Okay, you just can't see it in this particular slide. Questions? All right, real quick, Martina, moment, just because we need a little bit of a break. If somebody would turn on the light, so another exercise. I showed you how to do the um, the mobility squat. If you remember, problem, some of the problems that you have with sitting is that your, your, your hip flexors become tight. And when these become tight, they shut down the glutes. You get something called gluteal amnesia. That's problematic too. The glute, these are the main molars that drive any, any part of your system, right? So I'm going to show you an exercise that, that activates this. Okay? It stretches this out so that it deactivates it. Because if this side is flexing too much, it's gonna overstretch this side. And that means it's gonna shut this down. So it's, there's a condition called gluteal amnesia where your flexor gets out of track. Okay, so, and another thing you wanna do is you wanna open up this side because you're always in this sort of flexed thoracic position. The thing I'm gonna show you is the yoga move and it also happens to stretch out your shoulders, remember, which also are very tight, and also those tend to stretch out your biceps. And these will be volunteers. I'm sure you have it. It's simple. Everybody can 
got a name. All right. So Eli's going to lie on the floor sideways like that. Yeah. Okay. With your hands like that. Yeah. You're not, not going to lay down. All right. So what I'm going to have you do, if you have wrist mobility issues, in other words, your wrist issues, then you just put your hands out to the side. If you don't, you're better off facing them forward. Okay? So she doesn't have any issues because she's in great shape and all that, right? So she's going to put her feet on the floor, okay? Feet on the floor, and she's going to raise herself up as high as she can go. Keep going. And then you're going to drop your head back. This is, you can get in the best position. She's going to hold that. It's called table pose. Right? She's activating her glutes. She's opening up this area. She's also stretching this out and she's stretching her biceps. Right? And her back is contracting. She can drop her head or else it would bother you. You could do this for 30 seconds or a minute and stop for a second. Thank you. And it'll start to address some of this, these issues. From a strength perspective, too, it's a nice move. It's a yoga move. It's called table. I think that's it. Thank you. Because it's, everybody can do it. It's an easy stretch, and it's strengthening you at the same time. The mobility squat is really just a mobility drill, right? You're not getting any strength out of it until you actually come off the wall. This thing actually starts to activate things again, and starts to stretch things out that are too tight. Did you feel any, like you feel a stretch, you feel it in your shoulders. Wherever you're tight, that's where you feel it the most. If your hips are really super tight, going in the table pose, for 30 seconds, 10 seconds, whatever you can hold. And what you want to do is you want to try to come up as high as you can. You want, almost want to go in, in the hyperextension, okay? And, it, and it's a safe pose because it is static, right? So the two things I showed you so far that, that mobility squat is static, this is relatively static. It's an isometrical exercise. Actually, the old time strongmen in the 1800s and the early 1900s used to do something called Hercules II. Look it up. And what they would actually do is they would actually go into table pose, which was a strength move, and they would go into table pose, and then they would have a platform on them, and they would hold up things like horses, like big old safes that weighed a couple hundred pounds, and that's how strong they got, because think about it, you're in, a, you're in an isometric contracted hold. You're actually physically stronger in an isometric control position than you are maybe dynamically, and they would have all kinds of things, crazy, like a full-size horse, like an 800 pound horse, and they would hold it up, and they were able to do that over time. So you can imagine how much strength you can gain by doing a simple, I wouldn't recommend you know, getting a buddy of yours and putting a board on and saying, well, there's a horse in the field, maybe we can try a cow. It's not a good idea. Don't do it. But it's called Hercules Tomb. If you want to look it up, there's pictures of them. It's, it's really, really cool looking. Uh, it was based on on this, this pose, table pose. I think it's a chair pose. It's called table pose. All right? So that's an easy thing to do. And it's activation. You've got to rest anyway. Do a little bit of mobility with the other one. Do a little bit of activation in this one. I, next time, I'm going to show you the mobile, the dynamic version of something like that, which means you're moving. It's one thing to brace yourself, and I'll just brace this too, to brace yourself or have mobility when you're not moving. Okay? Like if you go to a PT, they do all these tests, AT does it too, right? Usually they're static, right? So you do these static tests and you say, okay, you're fine. Especially if you're a really good athlete, right? You do all these tests and you're like, oh, yeah, they're fine. Yeah, load them up and see if they're fine. We have a student here who's now a PA. He was in the AT department. His name was Brett. Uh, very, very good student. He spent a couple of uh, summers with the Chicago Bears. We were talking about we just got the functional movement screen and done all kinds of cool stuff. So we, we talked a lot in those days. Okay? At AT students and I, we talk all the time about stuff. And I said, Brett, with this functional with this movement screening stuff, when you get to the Bears, do they have to screen? Like these are elite athletes, right? He's like, they're all in terrible shape. They're all train wrecks. Every one of them, but they move so great, they're so fast, they're strong, because yeah, but when you go to these, when you start running them through screening processes, they're just as screwed up as everybody else. The only difference is 
between them and you and me is they're faster and stronger. But they're, they're screwed up too. So if that, that made me realize, oh, if this is something that's pervasive throughout the society, they're just, how much better would they be if they were to come in and we fix these issues? And how much less would they hurt? Anyway, that's the, the static one. Next time I'll show you a dynamic one that shows you how to move it. <coughs> All right. Getting back to what we were talking about before, because we're going to go back into it. Any questions on what we talked about so far? With the cells, the backup plan, plan B. Okay, plan B. No? All right, so if somebody would again lower, please, I'd appreciate it. All right. So again, these are cilia because they're wispy. Uh, a place that you find this, obviously, is in the uterine tubes. Goblet cells are there to secrete mucus, again. You want to have mucus in this area too. It's a lubricant. And then cilia modal membrane extensions move mucus forward. So they're actually an, ex an extended part. They're not an extension of the plasma membrane or the, the cytosol of the cytoplasm, right? Where the, the microvilli are. They actually contain the cytoplasm within them. These do not. The respiratory system in the uterine tubes. Okay. So ciliated simple columnar, the, the slides are getting better. Again, you'd have to be really close, but you could see the cell boundaries. Each one of these nuclei, some of the nuclei are round, some of them are oblong. But again, can you see the wispiness here? When you can see that wispiness in there, it's not 100% certain, but it's probably more likely that it's cilia than microvilli, because microvilli wouldn't have these breaks in them. Because if you have a break, you lose surface area for absorption. So you don't want any breaks. So you want more of a solid layer. So you could say, well, this is aluminum too. These look like they're um, columnar. And I'm going to say this is cilia. So this is ciliated simple columnar. Where it is, it could be the fallopian tubes. It could be in the respiratory tract. So pseudostratified epithelium, right? And we saw this one the other day. Appears to have several layers because the nuclei are at various levels. All cells are attached to the basement membrane, but all do not reach the apical surface. Again, this is just a repetitive. Just we already went through this. You should have this in your notes. In pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, the cells that reach the surface either secrete mucus, goblet cells, or they bear cilia that sweep mucus away. So this is one of the ones where I'm showing you where it's flat, right? And then this is the ciliated. So this would be the one that produces the mucus. This one does not. And so usually you would flank them, right? In the respiratory tract or even in the fallopian tubes, you'd have another cell here, like this, right? So this is the simple ciliated columnar epithelium. And this is usually non-ciliated, but this could also be pseudostratified simple columnar. So it can be either or. So this one's sort of a question mark, but they're usually flanked by ciliated. So whatever this is, is gonna produce mucus that's going to come out here that then can attach to things or can flow upstream. Questions on that? Does that make sense? Yeah, Annika. So non-ciliated columnar cells don't necessarily have to have microvilli? They don't. Okay. Most of them do. And most of the time in the, in the respiratory tract, when you see a goblet cell, it's usually pseudostratified. But it doesn't have to. Again, there's exceptions to every rule. Pseudostratified non-ciliated columnar epithelium contains no cilia or goblet cells. They contain no cilia. This is wrong. I don't know where that came from. 
That's wrong. No cilia. And no, this is for stratified. This that's just wrong. I actually erased that. That's this statement is wrong. Just forget about this. Up until here it's right. This is not correct. Okay? I just told you that goblet cells. Okay? Sorry. So mark that out. Say whatever slide this is that there's a an error in there, just cross it out. I'll fix it as soon as we're done here, but make sure that you don't get it wrong. Okay. So here we go. So now we're in the trachea, the largest wind pipe you have, right? The trachea, right? Use the, here's the gland, use the laryngea, right? So now you have cells, and again, this is, forget about this junky thing, it's a terrible diagram. You have connective tissue, now you have nuclei that are all over the place. Where are the nuclei? Here, 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 here. You see how they're all over the place? It's like a shotgun pattern. When you see a shotgun pattern and you see some here, and you see some here, and some in the middle, now you're starting to think pseudo-stratified. Because if I draw a straight line across here, how many of those nuclei do I really capture? Hardly any. But when I did it in the other one, there were some that didn't ca get captured by that line, right? But they were pretty close. Here, they're not even in the ballpark. If I draw a straight, pick a line. If I draw a line here, there's still all of these nuclei here, all of these nuclei here, and all of these nuclei here that I don't capture. They're so far away from the line that now you've got to start saying to yourself, either it's truly stratified or it's pseudo-stratified. So now, you now, again, you're narrowing it down to 50-50 choice. And then you've got to say to yourself, OK, well, what other types of things do I see in here? Well, this is a goblet cell because this is fat, the lipid base, so this is probably mucus. This is ciliated because these are wispy. It's not non-ciliated simple columnar because that would be a, a straight like sheet. So it's not in the intestines. So the question is, is it, is it stratified columnar or pseudostratified? Stratified columnar is very rare. It is a rare type of cell makeup. And so your chances are pretty good that if you start seeing long cells and it looks like you stacked them, unless it's a trick question, and then again, they show up in the weirdest places. All these weird cells show up in the eye for some reason. Okay? You're probably saying it looks like it looks like stratified columnar. He said it's rare, it is, it does exist. It's got mucus in there, it's got cilia, it's probably pseudo-stratified simple columnar, right? And so that's that's in fact what it is. Again. You're, you're doing most of this rote memorization. You're only falling back on this in case maybe to check or to make sure or, or to give yourself a 50-50 chance in case you have no idea. All right. So we'll wait for next time for that. All right. Three most important things. Yeah, Jordan. Yeah, so if you're looking at a slide, cilia are wispy. It looks like they're hair projections. The microvilli, it looks like a, a sheet. They're stiffer, they're packed really close, they're harder to see gaps. Okay, that's one. Yeah, okay. Stratified versus non stratified. Look for, draw a line. Are they very far off of that line? If they're close, even if it's off a little bit, it's probably not stratified. If it's there, if, if you draw a line, several lines, and you never capture the majority of those nuclei, then you're probably dealing with some kind of pseudo stratified structure. Yeah, Alana. Yes, squamous is for diffusion and filtration, to boil is secretion and absorption. All right, a fantastic day.
test been close next week, end of next week, so start thinking about it. Excellent. And I'll make that correction now. Sorry about that.